Faith Goldie, which has a whole lot less deer shooting than I thought it was going to have. And she is a journalist with The Rebel Media. You can check out Faith's amazing work at therebel.media forward slash Faith Goldie, uh, twitter.com slash Faith Goldie, and the appropriately named instagram.com slash Faith Goldie. Uh, Faith, thank you so much for taking the time today. I don't think anyone's ever said my name so many times in such a short span of time. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, usually <laughs> that's when you're being interrogated. <laughs> so let's keep it, uh, keep it loose. So... It's Canada Day today, 150 years young, uh, and um, there is, of course, a very potent debate about what Canada is at the moment. Now, when I grew up in Canada, I first came to Canada in 1977, and Canada was a, a sort of patriotic, a proud nation, an anti-communist nation. I remember, of course, there was still the aftermath of the um, great game against the Soviets in the Olympics, I think, in the early 70s. And it was a, a sort of a, a tough and, and rough uh, kind of uh, place uh, and uh, energetic and, and focused and very committed to core historical Western values, you know, separation of church and state and um, uh, free speech and uh, freedom of thought. And there seems to have been uh, just a little bit of a drift uh, in the uh, 40 years or so that I've been here. Now, I wonder if you could sort of talk about the Canada that you knew, the Canada that you know, and where you think it might be heading. Absolutely. Well, the rate at which our country has absolutely done a head stand uh, is un as far as I'm concerned. It was only a couple of years ago that, of course, uh, Stephen Harper was in charge here, and that's when we were really acting like a G7 nation. We were making moves without the UN. We were calling them out for their climate change uh, agenda. We were deploying ships to Libya before the UN resolution was ever passed. We were shaking Putin's hand at the same time saying, get out of Ukraine. Um, we were acting like a primary power, which is what a G7 nation should do, and we had a very um, concise and articulated set of Canadian values, one that sure... Uh, we, we paid protective lip service to things like diversity, and, and we had a, a an airtight immigration system. But now, uh, instead of being against the communists, now the communists are in control, namely uh, our prime minister, our feminist prime minister, Justin Trudeau, but more importantly, um, his puppeteer, a man by the name of Gerald Butts, who is, of course, a disciple of Saul Alinsky, who has brought in this cultural Marxist divide and conquer um, um, deployment of, of ridicule as though we have never seen where in every single person that objects to any part of their agenda, which is indeed radical, it is anti-nationalist, it is pro-globalist, it is diversity on hyper-steroids, and, and it is uh, an absolute detriment to our country, and we're seeing it already so soon in the game. And if you if you criticize him on that, well, then you're 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 Islamophobic, you're transphobic, you're homophobic. And again, it's just a Solinsky tactic where when someone gets in your way, you ridicule them and it shuts them up. And and it's gone beyond self-censorship and political correctness. It's bullying from the, the, the political pulpit. And right now, I don't see anyone in the wings who's prepared to take him on. So who knows how bad it's going to get? It's, it's a shame because it's probably my first, I'm, 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 I just turned 28. It's probably my first Canada Day where um, I'm, I'm sad, to be honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know what you mean. There's this sort of ambivalence about the ideals versus the reality versus the trajectory. And we'll get into the demographics in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But this question of diversity has sort of been haunting me for, for many, many a year. I actually worked in a diversity department in a major corporation, and I was very keen on the idea. But as I sort of went along, I began to sort of notice, like I went to three different universities uh, in, in Canada. I went to, to York, I went to McGill, I went to University of Toronto, spent a little bit of time at the National Theatre School. And I have been since my teens like a very small government, uh, big free market. And that seems to me diversity. Like if you look at central planning or a communist economy versus the, you know, vibrant creative destruction of a free market, um, there's very little diversity at all in uh, communism. And... I was never welcomed in Canadian universities as, hey, wow, we don't have a lot of libertarians around here. Hey, you know, we don't have a lot of small government guys around here. You're really going to shake things up. You're going to add to the colorful mosaic of Canadian thinking. It was almost like, oh, small government, you must be a fascist. You know, that's, of course, indicating that nobody seems to have a clue anymore what the word fascist means. And I just sort of noticed, like, I've never noticed the government say, you know, we don't have enough libertarians in, in colleges, uh, in teaching positions. We don't have enough conservatives uh, in the mainstream media. They don't really seem to be at all interested in diversity. There is this kind of drab, Pravda-esque uni uh, uniformity on the left that seems the very opposite of what they claim they want. 
Absolutely. They don't practice what they preach. Um, but I think once upon a time, um, diversity for us meant in an almost classical liberal sense of the marketplace of ideas, so to speak. Uh, everyone can come here, but of course, like any liberal democracy, we have parameters around our society. And so long as you exist within these fairly well-defined uh, boundaries, we'll all get along, get along and, and go along. However, now what we've seen is a mass importation of diversity that is fundamentally uh, incongruent and antithetical to our liberal democracy, whether it be um, the mass importation of a refugee population from a part of the world where um, women, homosexuals, <clears throat> pardon me, et cetera, are not seen as, as, as equal. That, that, that is certainly part of it. And, and when it comes to, to diversity at, at the government level, look, there this this prime minister has not allowed a single pro-lifer say to to run underneath his banner there's no such thing as diversity of thought when it comes to the institution of government itself right now federal level and there's anyone who again is it says that the diversity that we're importing right now is is not excellent will be ridiculed and, and not get too much into specifics or, or lead us down a path that perhaps you wanted to explore a little bit later on but um i recently covered uh, like white genocide in canada and the fact that we are bringing in four out of four out of every five immigrants bringing in are non-white. And this is something that you've covered, I know, at length on your channel. And that's the fact that white people are the only um, one in the world who actually favor en masse less government. So is it any wonder that we have big government, capital L liberals, wanting to import diverse um, peoples who frankly will want more welfare, want bigger government? It's, it's again, not, not promising for the future of Canada. This, I think you, you've pointed out, and I, I haven't talked about this much in the show, so I'm glad we're touching on it now. This idea that there's something in sort of white, Christian, Western European, Greco-Roman society that wants freedom, that thirsts for freedom, that thirsts for mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial opportunities to cast your mind into the uh, net of ideas and just shake it around and see what comes out to, to sort of stride confidently into the marketplace of ideas. We don't want government in the way. We don't want government taking our property. We don't want government regulating our thoughts. We as a culture benefit enormously, as does the world, I would argue, from a smaller government. And there's something that happened around the 1960s, you know, with the welfare state and with the change in immigration policies that started in England and then in the United States and a little bit later in Canada. There's something where the people on the left said, I think we're going to run out of demand for government if this European thing keeps going the way it's going. So let's try and find a way that we can maintain the demand for the supply called the state. Uh, and look, well, poverty was being solved, uh, racial inequalities were being solved, women's liberation was being achieved. The need for government diminished, and then it's like, okay, well, if the need for government is diminishing, how can we maintain the demand for it? Well, let's bring in a whole bunch of people who are going to depend on government, who are from cultures that are used to big government, who are going to vote for big government. It was like a way of sustaining the beast we've tried to tame for the past 5,000 years. Absolutely. And it's not just done through their immigration policy, Stefan. Um, of course, you're, you're referring to the cultural Marxists, and I really do think that they are, are so much the, the heart of what has led to the crumbling of the West right now, the decline of the West. These guys from the Fabian, the Frankfurt School, um, Isol Alinsky, etc. Um, well, actually, it was Antonio Gramsci before him, uh, who... who come to America, come to the West in the 1950s and 60s and say, we want to grow government. And so we have to indeed manufacture a crisis in which um, the state can grow. And so what they did automatically was um, target the two biggest obstacles to state expansion, and that is family and the church. Um, because of course, both those things are above or nearer to you than the state. And once they did that, they found certain movements that would manufacture crisis and allow for the state to grow, uh, whether that be environmental, you know, de demonizing the cheapest forms of energy and then nationalizing the much more expensive stuff, including all this green en energy mumbo jumbo. Feminism, what a better way to break down the family uh, outside of slavery and say um, the criminal conveyor uh, belt judicial system that we have is, is attacking women. And feminism, uh, women's lib, don't have kids, go out there, get a career, sleep around. Here's the pill, by the way. Um, and and uh, so many other, uh, uh, divide and conquer, Black Lives Matter now. It, it's just, it's shape-shifting all, all, all along. And what we see is that it, it fragments society. It creates a crisis where it's either, you know, the oppressor and the oppressed, the haves, the have-nots, 
Um, the, 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 in our country right now in Canada, race doesn't work as well. So they've gone to religion, um, you know, the Islamophiles versus the Islamophobes. And then in comes government with a solution to a problem which organically never existed, whether it be, uh, you know, solar uh, panels of some sort sold to you at an inflated rate, or whether it be M103, this Sharia creep motion that we have that's going to essentially ban Islamophobia without ever defining it. All of this is to increase the state and to get away from the individual. But if I may for a second, I will say, and I don't know if you've noticed this too, Stefan, I think within conservative circles, specifically within the millennial populace, what I'm seeing now is a sort of fetishize, a fetishization rather of of bigger power. And I think it's because of the fact that what we've seen is um, such a high degree of degeneracy of where freedom has led us um, in the hands of cultural Marxists, where freedom hasn't led us to, say, produce more, to be creative, to, to be, to use our imaginations. It's let us down this sort of, you know, pornography and MTV sort of culture where um, people have been robbed of all sort of meaning. And I'm seeing this, this rise at least of, of, and I know it's an uncomfortable conversation, but if you spend a lot of time on the internet as I do, then you certainly see it as well. And it's, I just worry that there are beautiful and bright minds on the right right now that might be um, slowly falling into the grips of the wrong team. Right. This, uh, and you did a video, which um, we'll link to below about this, um, the hypersexualization of childhood is something that mm -hmm. is very disturbing. I remember even back in, in high school, like, why is the teacher telling me about sex? Why is the teacher teaching me sexu sexual education? Surely that should be the province of my family, or that should be the province of my church if I have one. It should be the province of, of my culture. Why on earth is the government telling me about all of these things? It seems kind of creepy, and it seems kind of weird. And the breakdown of the family has, I think, Accom been accompanied by the breakdown of the transmission of sexual restraint. And without sexual restraint, it seems almost impossible to maintain a free society because the consequences of a lack of sexual restraint, single parent households, STDs, unwanted pregnancies, you name it, and the general harming of everyone's capacity to, to love and to bond with each other, when you don't have sexual restraint, you seem to have a very big government. And I think that's another thing that I mm -hmm. see coming in in the 60s was the hypersexualization. And I wonder if you can talk about some of the stuff you've seen online because you, you opened a door that, you know, you feel like you need a blast helmet of <laughs> like moral absolutism to walk through unscathed. But it's really fascinating and disturbing what you found all over the place on YouTube. Absolutely. Well, uh, actually, the sexualization of children is what kind of got me into the journalistic profession. Uh, I and, and I just as kind of to put it in a, a larger context, um, I was covering a particular sex ed curriculum that we have now in Ontario in, in its first generation. And um, what it did was, you know, teach grade sixers about anal sex, grade threes about uh, gender dysphoria and all the different types of genders that exist. Um, and what I noticed was a concerted effort from folks on the left, governments on the left, to um, inject this sort of demoralizing um, age inappropriate sexualization of young people. And I was like, well, what the heck is going on over here? And as my career in journalism has continued, it is an ongoing theme. And now this is not to say, as a preface here, this is not to say that, you know, every pedophile or every sexual deviant is a uh, left leaner, but the advocacy for them seems to be. Um, so what I found on, on YouTube, and I can't take full credit for this um, insofar as H3H3 Productions paid protected lift service this some time ago. Uh, and it's this trend of Spider-Man and Elsa videos. And if you've existed on YouTube, you'll know that this is a huge phenomenon. We're talking about tens, if not hundreds of millions of views for a lot of these videos. And it's supposed to be, you know, Spider-Man and Elsa, the Disney and, and Marvel characters going about doing kitty sort of things. But then as the video goes on, uh, most of them are about 10 minutes in length, at around the halfway point, what you start to see are really, really disturbing um, images, uh, whether it be um, abortion, uh, where someone will present as pregnant and someone will come in with like, you know, a needle or a knife. And then the, the stomach will deflate. Um, also, um, just graphic sexual sorts of like dry humping and thongs going on. And um, 
my question is is why is youtube demonetizing and censoring like i can barely put islam or terrorism in any of the videos that i craft as part of the title because i know that i'm going to have to appeal the process because i know that they're probably going to be demonetizing it even though i'm talking about a terrorist attack that actually did happen and by the way i'm creating content largely for adults um, you know <laughs> i'd say the majority of my audience is about 16 17 18 plus like these are people who can by and large drive uh, smoke drink you know they have a formed brain by and large and can do what they please with the information that i put out but this stuff is all being marketed to kids and so why are they incorporating this sort of degeneracy in there so um the good thing is is that it's starting to make waves now and elsa gate as a hashtag is is starting to get garner some attention and as i understand it i believe some of the videos have indeed been demonetized but what my end game was basically was just to act as a public service announcement to parents who might think that their kitties are just watching you know, like a cute little cartoon, but indeed what's being done there is the engendering of some pretty age inappropriate motifs. Yeah. And I mean, it is, I don't, I don't get the Spider-Man Elsa connection, but I mean, I Me may either. just be unplugged with all of that, but you know, masked men doing ser sexually surreptitious or abortion specific things to an endless parade of white women just seems kind of creepy on every conceivable dimension that I can imagine. Here, here. Absolutely. And we know and we know that abortion is in and of, of, in and of itself an industry. Right. And uh, it is a business. And the fact that you have Planned Parenthood um, co-sponsoring so many sex ed curriculums on both sides of the 49th should alert everyone that there's something going on. Because, again, are they manufacturing a crisis to which they can provide the solution? Oh, wow. Kids getting knocked up at a young age. Gee, I wonder how you can solve that. Planned Parenthood. Step in. So, well, if you remove the consequences of uh, a lack of sexual restraint, then given that human sexual desires are so strong, it's kind of why we're all here to begin with. If you uncork that sexual restraint, then you are going to destabilize society and you are going to destabilize the family and you are going to provide direct challenges to people of religious faith to be able to sustain that religious faith. And of course, abortion, as you pointed out, violates the fifth commandment, if I remember correctly. And yeah. so to me, a lot of government policies have been a around uh, a hypersexualized childhood and then remove the consequences of that hypersexualization. And in a sense, it's like the dam busters in the old uh, World War II movie. Uh, you know, you, you put that explosive at the bottom of the dam, the dam busts and civilization itself seems to be getting washed away. Right. And it's also, it's just about the demoralization, right? If you look at any sort of tyrannical regime, what you'll notice is that they, whether it be, um, uh, you know, Hitler's Germany or Stalin's USSR, they imported mass amounts of pornography for their young soldiers, et cetera, to use the level of homosexual activity that uh, occurred on high ranking um, uh, SS. For, for instance, there's a great book called The Pink Swastika that talks all about this, but the, the, the pervasiveness of homosexuality at these levels. And when you deprive someone of morality and what is the most precious sort of morality we can have besides our sexual morality it is something that is so deeply personal and and edifying if it exists and it can be totally destabilizing if it is indeed um no longer upheld and so i think that that the the end game is to demoralize the populace because if you do not have a moral background well then it's pretty easy to mend you as i please and this question of the focus on not having children seeming to forever west on on white women and, and white men and white culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I was growing up, there was all of this zero population growth and it's bad for the environment and don't have kids and being a housewife and a mother is beneath you. You need to go out and, and, and carve your way in the world, Kramer versus Kramer style. And then, of course, there was this big switcheroo where it's like, oh, sorry, we don't have enough population, so we have to import everyone from the third world to make up for it. And that's sort right. of a bit of a bait and switch. Don't need those kids. Kids are bad. Oh, you see, we don't have enough kids, so we're going to have to kind of vote your culture out of existence. That, to me, seems interesting because I don't see a lot of people going to, going to mosques or going to other uh, areas of worship and giving big lectures on don't have kids. It really only seems to be focused on one particular group. And again, it's, you know, it's very, very very sinister if you take you know the fact that it's whites out of it and substitute any other group that would be considered a very sinister uh, approach to population replacement absolutely i 
think that's why you're seeing this rise of the alt-right, frankly, is that they're, they're sick and tired and they're not going to take it anymore. They're sick and tired of being told, you're okay. it's great to, to have kids, to be proud of your culture, to be proud of your people, to just defend your people. Um, but unless you're a white man, then just please don't. Or a white woman, for, for that instance. And my white genocide video was the talk of the town here on Toronto radio stations for a full week because what racist bigot I am for pointing out the fact that Canada right now is um, the, the fastest changing um, country when it comes to our ethnic just demography. So in other words, our population replacement is happening at a faster degree than even Germany and Sweden. So I'm just pointing to the numbers. This is Statistics Canada, our official statistic, uh, statistic agency in this country, and I'm the racist and the bigot. But you're 100% right in saying that it has been directed towards one particular people. The good news is, is that in certain countries, at least, there seems to be um, an awakening, a renaissance, if you will, where people are saying, well, we need to get back on, on the baby wagon, so to speak. But I mean, I don't know if we can keep up, to, to be honest, with the mass importation of the Middle East, the exodus of the Middle East into Europe right now. Uh, I read a report just yesterday, 360,000 asylum claims just since the beginning of the year, 100,000 people just on the shores of Greece and Italy. In, in, in just the past six months. Like, that's that's kind of crazy, you know. Uh, Spain's appointed a sex czar. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. Uh, but what we need is more pamphlets, too. Yeah. You know, I find that you, you may have a thousand years plus or, or many thousand years of, of cultural uh, and uh, ethnic development and, and religion and so on. But I find all of that can be swept aside with one pamphlet or perhaps a couple of dozen hours of re-education. That's all, Faith. That's all that Western civilization is. It's a pamphlet and a couple of videos uh, in a dusty room. And, and boom, everyone's transformed. I don't know why we did all of this stuff. I don't know why there's a Bible. I don't know why we had Aristotle. I don't know why we had Copernicus. I don't know why we had a scientific revolution. I don't know any this we could have just read a couple of pamphlets and watched a couple of videos and boom it's instantly photocopied and permanently embedded in another human brain it's amazing <laughs> why do we send kids to school for so long just give them a pamphlet and they'll change that okay i could do that all day but i, I think people get the point <laughs> No, it's sad. And you know what? Our education system is part of it, uh, is, is part to blame, to be honest. You know, they teach you about things like um, contraceptives, but not abstinence, right? They teach you about um, all sorts of cultural Marxism and don't tell you about how to be a good wife or mother. My sister right now, she's 26. She's about to deliver baby number two. Our mom has since passed. And, you know, she says, I was never taught these sorts of things in school. We're taught about all this rubbish about, you know, the global community, etc. How about you teach kids in this country what or otherwise how to be good parents and just family values no of course not because again it would be an obstacle to the state i know it sounds simple and commonsensical but uh, our education system is part to, uh, part to blame for all of this and so that's why frankly the government's allowed to get away with what they do and this diversity i think is is the wrong word because of course i mean europe has tons of diversity you know looking at pictures of women across the middle east i'm not seeing quite the amount of diversity uh, at least in terms of from the outside in but I think what's, I don't know if there's a great word for it, probably the closest I would come up with faith is something like balkanization. Mm -hmm. Because as you point out, okay, so there's, there's Brampton, right? Brampton used to be a, a white a suburb, and now mm -hmm. it's basically a non-white suburb. Because the people, let's say Indians, right? So people come from India or from Pakistan, where do they go and live? They're not going to go live in some back street in Sudbury or up in Nunavut or whatever. They're going to go in general as a whole. They're going to go to where the most Indians already are. Now, nobody says to those Indian or Pakistani immigrants, no, 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 you don't, you shouldn't go to move to where your people are because that's not diversity. They never get criticized for being insular and inward looking and wanting to be around their own culture, their own race, their own ethnicity, their own history. Nobody ever criticizes that. Uh, yeah, and and that is the double standard that just really needs, like, you, you, you can't bring it up often enough. You can't hit the point hard enough. This is a ridiculous double standard that whites are being held to one standard, which is uh, constantly give up your culture, your history, your pride. If you're a proud white person, you're a racist automatically. If you're a proud black person, well, you're just... It's great, wonderful. I'm glad you're taking pride in your history. And Absolutely. If you live in a white neighborhood, you know, it's, it's something that's seen as bad. 
Right. So I that you think you can inject some more diversity. Yeah. F for whites to have an in-group preference is automatically racist and evil and Nazi and this and that. But for other groups to have in-group preferences is cultural pride. This double standard, I don't know if by design or just by effect, is going to create an extraordinary amount of conflict because people can only live with hypocrisy and, and vicious verbal abuse and, and endless attacks. People can put up with that for a little while, but after a while, they just won't. All right. And especially in this country, that was just a byproduct of uh, the policy of multiculturalism, which is, of course, um, an official policy in this country, wherein it has not led to assimilation like the melting pot that the United States is supposed to be. It's led to a sort of cultural self-quarantine and ghettoization where you've got Chinatown, you've got little Arabia, you've got little Italy and what have you. And everyone just kind of stays to their own enclave. And you can have people living in this country for literally a decade who cannot speak English or French as in, in any sort of conversational way. And it's because of the fact that they've only been surrounded by like-minded um, folks and, and uh, who speak the same language. It's going to lead to an absolute breakdown. And the, um, the question about different ethnicities, different cultures, different histories, to me comes down to this. I don't want to judge anyone uh, on the basis of a group. I think that's uh, obviously statistically wrong and irrelevant. I want to take people as they come. But when you zoom out enough, as I'm sure you're aware, people don't act the same based on right. ethnicities. They don't act the same based on race. They don't act the same based on culture. And, you know, you don't know if any particular Chinese person is short relative to, say, a Danish person. But if you aggregate enough, you can come up with um, group generalizations that are fairly mm -hmm. valid. And, you know, people don't act the same. There are certain groups who vote for bigger government. There are certain groups who want smaller government. There are certain groups uh, that, that promote freedom of speech, and there are other groups that seem to oppose freedom of speech, and they can be aggregated. And so just pretending everyone's a complete individual is ignoring, it's, it's very much anti-science, it's almost anti-mathematics, that there are group differences in how people vote and behave and the cultural values that they have. And uh, absolutely, there's something okay. to be troubled about that. If you want freedom, then there are groups who statistically aren't going to be as much on your side as other groups. Absolutely. But but if I may say, look, part of the scientific debate is, you know, nature versus nurture. And I understand if you zoom out, those trends are there. Believe me, I do. Um, my question is, um, is moral relative or cultural relativism rather part to blame for this? And so far as I'm happy to judge, I'm happy to say that our society is better than other societies in the world. I'm happy to say that our uh, idealistic and realistic way of life is better than our other parts of the world. So you come here, you leave your baggage from your home country, you learn our language and you live our way. And if not, pack up your bags and get the hell out of here. And and so uh, while I do understand that, that there are certain... Um, roadblocks, let's say, to certain types of groups to uh, assimilate perhaps or um, organically want the same things as other groups. I think that there, these sorts of things can be engendered through um, through education, frankly, and, and through, but, but the problem is, is then who gets in the, uh, who gets in control of the education system tomorrow and what will they be teaching the masses? I get it. Look, uh, I'm going to be completely frank and just like call a spade a spade. I, I understand a lot of the arguments of the race realists who are out there. Um, I just don't know if I can arrive at the same conclusions as them. I think that while those realities might exist, I don't know what good they serve us in a realistic sense. I, I'm not interested in, in hypotheticals. I'm interested in how we can actually form public policy based on the science and, and the experimentation that exists. And I'm not sure how you can arrive at, you know, um, the, the ethno state without a really massive state. I don't know how you can get to a, a ethno state pan Europa um, without, again, a tyrannical regime getting you there. And, and then what? And then we're, we're, we're the EU again without migration? <laughs> Um, like no, just, uh, anything, that, anything that serves to increase the size and power of the state, I'm going to resist to my dying breath. So I'm certainly yeah, with you then, that uh, if it takes a giant government for an ethno state, it's the worst of every conceivable world. Now, mm -hmm. but I think one of the great challenges is that migrations in the past, I think it's a fairly safe case to, I mean, tell me if you, if you disagree, of course, I think it's a fairly safe case to say that, that great migrations in the past were value driven. I sort of think of the, the big one that's, that's sort of brought up, which is uh, the, the, movement of Europeans to uh, America and to Canada in the 19th century. Well, why did they come? Mm -hmm. Well, they sure as hell didn't come for the welfare state because it wasn't there. <laughs> they wasn't didn't there. come for free health care because it wasn't there. They didn't come for free education because it wasn't there. What did they come for? They came for freedom.
Not free and stuff, I'm, freedom, which are two opposites as far as the political spectrum goes. You want free stuff, you can't have your freedom. You want your freedom, you can't have your free stuff. Whereas now in the West, people are being bribed in figures we can't even conceive. Like, like on average, somebody who goes from the Middle East to Europe uh, gets 10 times more on welfare than they could possibly earn working 12 hours a day uh, in the hot sun in, in the Middle East, right? So it's, it, it's really important to understand how much people are being bribed to come into the West. Now, if I'm some rich guy and I, I keep going out to, to nightclubs, it's like, hey, everything's on me. All the stretch limos are on me. Uh, all the glitter dust is on me. All the DJs, all the drinks, all the food. It's all, do I actually have any friends? No. Are they, are they coming because of the wonderful joys of my personality and the wit of my demeanor? No, they're coming because I'm paying for stuff. Yeah. And so before... I had no problem with anybody, anyone who wants to come to a free country, I know they're coming for the freedom and it's like, great, we have all of that in common. But when you start paying people to come, when you start funding people to come, and when you give them more free stuff in a year than they could earn in a lifetime at home, I don't know if they're here for the freedom. I don't know if they're here for the freedom or they're here for the free stuff. And if they're here for the free stuff, they're at odds with my desire for freedom. Absolutely. And it's not even just for the free stuff. They're here to conquer. Like, let's just call it what it is. It's mass Muslim migration that's happening across the West right now. And when they get to these countries, yes, they get the free house, they get the, the welfare, the social benefits, etc., the child care, and then they create their no-go zones and march in the streets. And look, this has been a coordinated attack, like you, like you or a coordinated invasion, I should say. Like you rightly point out, I mean, they've been offered things from our side, so to speak. The, the borders ac across the Schengen area, the 28 states that make up the European Union, do not exist. The outer border right now does not exist. And all of the EU states within there got pranked. They saw, signed a bad deal that said they can't have borders in between. So right now, Slovakia and um, Hungary, I believe, are in the EU court against the European Commission. And they're saying we want to reinstitute our borders. Too bad, guys. You signed a deal. You can't anymore. And so this has been designed from, you know, the globalist world order, whatever the hell you want to talk about, and whether they're doing it for um, as population replacement, uh, as a form of cheap labor, as a form of manufacturing that chaos that is already existing in order to expand the state. I don't think it's any one. I think it's a combination of all and possibly more things that I'm missing as well. But life as we know it is is... I don't think it's reversible at this point. You know, when communism was spreading, it was an idea. These are people. I think that history is going to look at the past, particularly um, 20 years, as what the hell were you guys thinking? Or maybe they'll all just be in the cabs and burqas and be like, Allahu Akbar. I don't know. Well, this question of, of what has gone so terribly wrong, there were, of course, a lot of thinkers, as you know, in, in the 20s and the 30s, mid-century, uh, uh, I guess all the way up to the present, who said that the moment you start having massive transfers of, of resources in society by the state, right, robbing from Peter to pay Paul and so on, well, of course, the poor outnumber the rich, and if you allow the poor to vote away the property of the rich, then it generally gets consumed, uh, and uh, the poor will vote for more property to be taken away from the rich and so on. And the only way to solve that is through debt and through money printing. Now, the money printing, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was telling my daughter the other day about inflation. And um, I was saying, you know, when I first came to Canada, get a candy bar for 10 cents. A dime. Get a candy bar for a dime. Within, I can't remember how long, but it really wasn't that long, like maybe 10 or 12 years. It was like a buck. Now, it's remained relatively stable ever since. There was this huge quasi-Weimar-style money printing that went on in the 70s and 80s. And that's been curbed as, as well. And now it's basically just gone to debt. Now, when you go to debt, you kick the can down the road. And this has happened repeatedly throughout history. And then when governments can no longer pay the unfunded liabilities they've promised everyone, generally they go to war because during war, people will accept sacrifices and diminishments of income that they wouldn't accept in peacetime. And so I think that the real sin here uh, was before you and I were born and uh, we, you know, yay, yay, we get to deal with it. But I think that the real sin here was allowing the government to become the central planning, social engineers of society, to take from this group, to, to pay for this group, to subsidize this group, to, I mean, to, to do all of this control of what used to be voluntary interactions and put it under the power of the state. That created, of course, a massive dependency class and a massive set of votes for large governments. 
and governments know they can't keep it going. I'm, I just wonder if part of me, I don't know if it's deep down or if it's up front. It's like, well, if we have a huge amount of social conflict, nobody's going to notice eventually that we can't pay our bills. No, oh, geez, that's I, I haven't heard that theory before. I like that, though. Look, the Federal Reserve and the federal income tax were both instituted at a time when they were between um, election and inauguration of a president, when virtually none of Congress was actually seated in there to take a vote. Um, the Federal Reserve should not exist as far as I'm concerned. And a really great book, if anyone's, in, if anyone's interested, is Godonomics. And it talks about um, inflation and borrowing um, and and how messed up it all is and how good it could be. I'm, I'm someone who believes in a 10% flat tax for everyone. I don't care how much you make. That's how much it's going to be. And um, cut, cut government spending as much as possible. That's it. I don't understand. I, I'm Greek and Ukrainian. About 60% of the populace in Greece right now is employed by the government. I look at all these generations of, of sociology and anthropology majors and poli-sci majors and I say, guess who's your future employer? The <laughs> government. It well, sucks. How are we supposed to cut back funding? I don't know. I mean, this is uh, this is an astonishing thing that has happened. And I mean, my my family has a lengthy military history, and when I think of the amount of sacrifice that was made by my forefathers to fight, what were they what were they fighting? What were they fighting when it came to communism? What were they fighting when it came to national socialism? They were fighting central planning and the redistribution of wealth. They were fighting massive government control over the economy. Uh, they were fighting subsidies, in a sense. They were f and, and everything that comes out of that, like the militarism, the dependency, the lying, the falsification of reality in order to keep the dependent classes uh, immune to their own future. And I think how many tens or going back in history, hundreds of millions of you know, largely men and sometimes women died to, to fight the state. And there was no way to take down the West from outside. I mean, weapons are too strong and, and so on. But something has happened where where everything that we fought to oppose and, and died to oppose is now being imposed internally in a way that it seems impossible to fight, except through words, which again, we hope through the internet is, is going to be enough. But I do sometimes, of course, like everyone have my doubts. You know, it, it reminds me of the story from the Bible, the land of milk and honey, where the next generation forgot the toils of their ancestors <laughs> right. to get them there. And I think that truly we, I, I don't know if it's I'm a Christian or, or what, but I do believe that there's value in suffering. And I think that our generation, by and large, has been one that's been devoid of real in-your-face sort of suffering. Like, you know, the wars have been proxy and fought elsewhere. Um, the debt we're told about um, hasn't really manifested in a way that's comprehensible to us. Like, we see those trillions and we don't really understand it. Um, the world's going to hell, but not in our backyard yet, at least on this continent. Uh, and I think that's why you see, um, a, a, again, a manufacturing of crisis of this like Antifa sort of crap. We're creating our own drama, even the infighting that's happening on the right right now. Like we're creating our own drama. Um, but but I, I do think that the time of reckoning is nigh and, and we will get a severe wake up call when all of this comes to roost from our, the monetary crisis and house of cards that that's about to explode, no doubt, um, to mass migration making its way over here. I mean, it's happening in Canada much more so in, in, than in the U.S. right now as just a percentage of our population of, of these migrants who are coming in, who do not assimilate, who are um, tainting towns and schools when it comes to sexual harassment and threats against teachers saying that, you know, we'll, we'll kill you because you don't believe in Allah. And, and you know, it's 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 easy to exi to ignore reality until reality comes and hits you in the face. And and I think that that's what's going to be happening to North America very, very soon. Right now, we're talking about a lot of ideas. Um, and I think that when the reality of those ideas comes to fruition, it's I don't know how strong we're going to be and in, 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 in prepared to fight for it. Well, you if you're right, you spend a lot of time in the wilderness. I mean, I'm thinking sort of <laughs> Churchill in the, in the 30s, right? If, if you're, I don't mean on the right, but if you're correct, if you're correct about, you know, people are like, oh, how ridiculous. Oh, how silly. Oh, how xenophobic. Oh, how wrong. And then when reality catches up, it, it is amazing how quickly you can go from an outsider to a leader if you have predicted things correctly. And so I think it's a lot about laying foundations. You know, as you point out in one of your videos, within 100 years, less than 100 years, uh, whites are going to be, what, 20% 
of Canada, look, I'm That's sorry, right. it's not going to be the same country. You can't just photocopy uh, the, the, the whites' preference for small governments and free markets and free speech and so on. You can't just photocopy that. It's not going to be the same country. And, um, and the real tragedy about this, I think, is there are, of course, a lot of people who come, uh, some people come for the welfare and some people come, you know, to try and affect cultural institutions in, in their direction. But a lot of people come to Canada because it's a pretty free country. A lot of people come to Canada because there's entrepreneurial opportunities. A lot of people come to Canada because it's a relatively low corruption government. And, and if we don't serve to defend those institutions, separation of church and state, free speech, uh, free markets as much as possible, if we don't work to defend those institutions, not only will we lose, but I think it's highly disrespectful to the people who came to enjoy those institutions. Uh, if they're not defended, then why did they move? If, if, if Canada ends up looking sort of like the third world, what was the point of coming to Canada? Yeah, well, we have no respect for history in the West, right? We that that has not been taught to us whatsoever, and and I think that this the the cultural relativism that's so pervasive right now. We say that we're just the same as everyone else. Don't worry about it. We're just the same as parts of Europe, and for that matter, North Africa, and and what have you. And that's why you see a lack of willingness to defend them. And I think also people. I mean. The, the problem with the problem with the right is um, so many folks are going to work and raising kids. Right, they right. they can't be on the front lines fighting this worthwhile battle all the time. And so what you have is a cabal of um, single, childless, um, homosexual, someone who's aborted their children, but adults basically on and the subsidized. left. And subsidized. And subsidized, yes. But but what I'm speaking about here is is the political class. These people who don't have any kids, their work is literally government, and so they're they're on a mission and on a crusade to see our entire society do a headstand. And when you cited that that 20% um, whites in less than a century from now, it is a literal demographic headstand. Right now, we're 80% of this country, and it's so funny because I live in a city, Toronto, where people will look around and be like, oh, it's a majority, uh, it's a minority majority city. In other words, when I look around, I went to the University of Toronto, for instance. Anytime I got on an elevator in Robarts Library, a big library, I was always the only white person on the elevator, like for, for all my years of being there. And so it's like you you kind of think like, oh, I'm already a minority. But then you look, you kind of zoom out for a second and oh, wow, no, it's actually 80 percent of the country is white. But in less than 100 years, because because of immigration, and this is where the demographics, I, I'm obsessed with immigration. If you've watched any of my stuff, you know that I'm obsessed with it because I think it tells us more about the government than say the, the, the war that's being waged on the, the woman's womb right now. Um, of, of what their plan is. And so because of immigration, because four out of five of our immigrants that come into this country every single year are non-white, in less than a century, we're going to go from 80% to 20%. So it is a literal headstand that our country will do. And maybe folks in Toronto and the big cities across Canada will not uh, be affected so much by it. But folks I know on the periphery and in the more rural ridings absolutely will be. And you can say, well, Faith, like what's race got to do with it? Because that is such a Canadian standpoint. Well, what does race have to do with it? And you're 100% right in saying there, there are differences, uh, even if it is something as fundamental as desire for government, something as fundamental, I, I forget about everything else. It just understand that in this reality, the idea of having a conservative or a, a libertarian, my goodness, um, reform sort of party uh, government ever come in is not going to happen 100 years from now. We're going to be choosing between the new Democrats and the liberals who will probably be more left of them. That's it. Well, I mean, and it, all you have to do is look at the left's insistence on where immigrants come from. You know, there, as I've, I mentioned in a show recently, there are hundreds of thousands of highly oppressed, stuck in shanty towns, living on very little food, white South Africans. Now, they are an oppressed minority who would, I'm sure, be desperate to come to Canada. Is there any movement to say, oh, well, look, there's an oppressed uh, minority. They already speak English. There's a similar cultural background. They would uh, fit in very well. No, because they're likely to vote for smaller government. They've seen the end result of diversity. Uh, and, and so uh, the fact that the, the people on the left are so keen to bring in people from the third world to the West tells you all you need to know about their voting patterns. If it was, if there was complete indifference, then why would it be so focused on third world immigration? Because they know they're going to vote for larger government. And that's something that is statistically borne out. 
Yeah, because the South Africans who are currently being genocided um, right now, the white farmers, the Afrikaners, um, they come from cultures like uh, they're Dutch, okay, they're Dutch farmers. That is where uh, Western work ethic was essentially espoused from, okay? These people don't want the government interfering with their stuff. They're good to till the land, thanks very much. And I'm so happy you actually brought up South Africa. Uh, one of my colleagues is South African, and um, I was talking to him. He's, he's a gentleman who's probably in about his 50s. And I was talking to him a little bit about the, the, the white genocide in South Africa right now. And and he said, you know, Faith, he said, I left South Africa with my wife. He said, we're in our middle age and we're starting brand new here. And we just thought, you know what, this is what we have to do. And God willing, we can buy a, a hundred years for our family in this new country. He said, I look around at Canada now. He said, maybe we'll get 30 years out of her. And I was like, Whoa. that was a bit of a pill for me me to swallow. I, I, as far as the, the um, white genocide in South Africa um situation right now look don't get me wrong south africa is a horrible place to live when it comes to uh, murder and rape and I, I know you've done uh, several videos on this um when it comes to murder and rape uh, statistics i mean half of the rape statistics i think are, are basically underagers 10 percent of them are children under three i mean these are some really startling sort of numbers that you're looking at so south africa is basically bad for everyone but when you have political leaders either in opposition or actually in government saying hey get out there and seize these white people's farms by force well is it any sort of mystery that these brutal murders are happening and and on top of that you know the south african government will say um oh it's oh they're just robbing they're just robbing oh, I think only about 30% of these murders involve some sort of robbery. So like <laughs> Seth Rich, but like <laughs> straight up, <laughs> sorry, we have to, um, but, but um, yeah, that's not what's happening here. It's, it's, it's racism and it's, it's racist murder. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll probably be putting a video on that next week because I find it very interesting. I think we need to have a measured approach to it and say that yes, all of South Africa is very dangerous, no matter who you are and what your skin color is. But hey, look at how this this is being targeted towards white people right now. And they are, um, oh boy, they, they are less than 10% of the population. I think it's around 8% of the population, white people in South Africa right now. Down from 40%. And again, this is, this is one of the... Um time tunnels that you can look down and it's not going to be the same everywhere but it should be enough to give a pause that when the whites became the minority they were persecuted they've been driven into into these squatters camps they've been um, uh, murdered that they, they, they have to live behind barbed wire they they can't walk their streets i mean we need to have conversations about this and this is one of the things you know with with, with trump and so on and, and the work that the rebel is doing and the work that that other people are doing we aim to have a conversation about facts and reality and statistics and uh, demographics and trends. And I think, at least I have some hope, that the you know general airstrike of racism and xenophobia and, and white supremacy, all, we're just going to have conversations. And I'm getting kind of sick and tired in my sort of very core faith just about being shouted down uh, all the time when I talk about reality. You know, nobody says... In the very constitution in Mexico is a principle that says you cannot change the demographics of Mexico. Love it. You, you cannot change the demo any any policy which is going to change the demographics of Mexico is automatically unconstitutional. Automatically can't be done. And well, how many people are, are screaming at the Mexican government and and at Mexicans for being racist and xenophobic and like it's it's such a like. I, it, it, double standards drive me crazy because I'm a consistency fetish guy, right? So the, the double standards and the hypocrisy, I don't know. I mean, as I said before, you know, white people, very nice, very accommodating, want the best for everyone. Uh, but boy, uh, you know, when, when we do hit that cornered wall, uh, things can change pretty quickly. And I really yeah. want to avoid that. It's, it's not just been a genocide, it's been a suicide. Let's be very honest. We're part of the bloody problem because we haven't stood our ground and, and we've waited this long and I fear it's gonna get worse before it gets any better. And speaking of double standards, you know what happens to illegals when they illegally enter into Mexico? They are jailed and deported, okay? Um, but, but but speaking about the, the demographic change, as I mentioned, I'm Greek and Ukrainian. And obviously Greece has been the very front lines of this, this, this migrant tsunami and invasion. And this must have been about two, three years ago. Uh, I go to Greece customarily every single summer to visit my family there. This year will be an exception. But um, two, three years ago, and I was there with my, my old man, my dad, and, and we thought, okay, we'll hit up some of the islands. You know, we'd just been there a year or two in advance with my late mother. Okay, sounds great. We go to the, the ferry depot, go to get our tickets, and we 
say we want to go to Lesbos and Samos. And uh, Ooh, do you? Said, <laughs> do you yeah, really? Said, this, this is two years ago, and the guy yeah. was like, the guy was like, no, you can't go there. And we said, well, what do you mean? He says, no, they've been turned into mini Afghanistan's and mini Syrias. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, and part of my French, people are defecating on the streets there. If you try to give them a water bottle and you're wearing a cross, they'll throw it back at you. And I was like. Holy hell, but I was just there. And he's like, nope, it's 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 gone. And so when I look at parties, say like the Golden Dawn, they they there are some parts that might be too edgy for folks, but at the end of the day, they are nationalists and they say that Greece should be for the Greeks. And they're not wrong, uh, frankly. You know, I'm Ukrainian as well. And say what you will about the 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 Russian invasion, and you know, you can speculate about that. That's a whole different conversation. Um my my countrymen who are around my age, who are of military age, they're digging trenches in Baba's backyards and they're fighting these Russians, okay? Why are these men doing that? Where the hell are they going to? Go back to your countries. And this is why, I'm sorry, when it comes to, to protecting the border and in the European lands, um, I think that the only way that we will see any sort of marked improvement and, and halt to the current invasion is a two-pronged approach, one of which is preventative, which would involve NATO troops being deployed, because most of, of the nations that are now being affected do have um, a, a piece of the NATO pie, so to speak. NATO troops being stationed a long um, the coastlines of Greece, Italy, and Cyprus, and I think that they need to be armed to the teeth, including RPGs, and they need to start firing at these boats. It is the only way that the message will go back to these countries that Europe is now closed for business. And quite outside of that, when you look at the actual adaptive approach to the folks who are go who are inside these countries right now, um, we need to shut down the madrasas that exist. Hundreds of thousands of young Muslims across Europe right now are being educated in, in doctrinal madrasas, some of which, most of which are still not regulated. The UK just started regulating their madrasas. Um, the radical mosques, shut them down. Anyone who's on a watch list, in turn, absolutely. And when it comes to, to, to if you want to keep these madrasas open in any sort of way, we frankly do have to turn them into re-education camps to a degree where they're taught, these children are taught European values, European history, and the European way of life. And, and if they want to study the Quran, it's going to be done in an honest way that shows how the 109 verses that say strike at the arms and necks of unbelievers are fundamentally incongruent with Western civilization. Sorry, that was my rant. Well, um, it seems hard to even have conversations about solutions. And I guess the last topic, which I think is worth dipping into is, you know, I, I get a, a bunch of, I do a call-in show and I get uh, a lot mm. of people calling in from Europe and the men, it's like their vocal timber and general lack of energy are, are like sort of brain vampires seeping the very marrow out of your spine. And they, they seemed to have given up. They seem to uh, just be resigned and, and mm -hmm. to look for petty, sensual or, or mental pleasures of the moment without any thought to the long-term preservation of uh, everything their ancestors died to hand to them. And one of the things that I've read about, and, and you've done a show about this in more detail, is that some of this may just have a basic biological cause. This mystery of declining testosterone. Uh, I think uh, may maybe I was just blessed with an excess of testosterone, which perhaps results in an excess of solar powered headroom. But um, <laughs> this testosterone decline is shocking. It's extra yeah. We have half the testosterone from 50 years ago, men on average in the West right. have half the testosterone. I mean, it does explain man buns, and it does explain male feminists, and it probably does a lot, lot to explain Justin Trudeau, although there's a whole complex series of haikus that would probably help with that as well. But I wonder if you can help people understand what an appalling decline it is, and of course, how little it's remarked about. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is something that scientists have been studying for the past about 20 years, and it's gained absolutely no uh, mainstream coverage whatsoever. And that is a trend that about every year, male testosterone is decreasing by 1% on average. Every year, that's not every decade, every every year by about 1%. And what um, these international reports from all over Europe, and including a few in America, um, have found is that it is not limited to, say, um, uh, older gentlemen. It's it's across the board, including men in their 20s. Now, part of the reason why I drew attention to this was because there's a bit of a meme on the internet about, like, you know, stay away from soy, soy is bad for you, etc. And uh, before... Um, I got into, I'd say even Sun TV before I was at The Rebel, uh, I had a small business. It was a natural healthcare business. And so I was always interested in the effects of food on your body, et cetera. And um, my mom's, uh, the cancer uh, that she had was a result of 
of too high estrogen. And so something that she was told by all these doctors and nutritionists was stay away from soy. And so I very early on, this is from years ago, started studying about the effects of soy and the fact that it does act as a phytoestrogen, as a type of estrogen within your body. And so, um, it, when I was looking for for reasons to to write about why soy is bad for you, I kind of stumbled across all this research of like, holy smokes, there's this net deficit of testosterone happening in the world. And we all joke about you know girly men. And in that piece, I I quote uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger being like, "Don't be economic girly man." And so it's, it's it's a thing that we've certainly seen. Like you just look at the like common physique of men today, and it's it's different. Not all. There are a lot of like good looking like hunky big guys, but I think that, you know, you look at the Antifa crowd and I'm like, I don't think that like my 26 size jeans are going to fit you, to be honest, bud. Like, they, well, they're, might they're just either drop, these, like, these like uh, out in the field stick men or, you know, pear shaped guys with half beards. I mean, it is, uh, it, it is not a good look either way. Well, and even the pear shape thing that's going on with their like man boobs, you know what I mean? Like that's a sign of estrogen too, I'm sorry to say. And so, um, yeah, I put this out there and that was another video that caused a lot of controversy for some reason. People like didn't like hearing about it. But what, what got me was the fact it's not like, so the reason why soy started being produced and used en masse in the West was because um, what we saw out of Japan was that um, high soy diets uh, were leading to a, an unusually high lifespan. But the thing is, is they were eating natto. That's like a type of, a type of fermented soy. Well, we have soy uh, in the soy that we eat here. It's 93% of it is GMO. And it's super cheap. And you can get a lot of different um, uh, products out of the soy that we use. But the problem is, is that um, now it's GMO. It's the GMO stuff is the stuff that uh, contains this phytoestrogen that mimics an estrogen inside both male and female bodies. And... Um, it's in basically everything. I, I dare anyone who, who's watching this to go into their pantry or their fridge after the interview and see if you can find anything that does not have soy in it that is in any way processed. It's basically packed into everything that we have. And I understand, again, I say this as a caveat, I'm not a doctor, etc. but mm. I have many healthcare professionals within my family and I run this by them and they're like, yeah, people don't talk about it, but it's 100% true. It's, it's like that weird moment when you try and find a breakfast cereal with that sugar in it and you're like, yeah. wait a minute, <laughs> Everything? Come on. I'm a dessert for breakfast. That can't be good for me. I can't, I'm no nutritionist, but I can't think a, a horse bag face full of sugar and first thing in the morning is going to do my day anything but, but harm. Yeah, meanwhile, meanwhile, all our kids have ADHD, right? It's like oh, yeah, yeah. And, off, and, and we have this myth that fruit juice is great for you. It's like, no, it's not. Um, now, and that, that I think is fascinating. I have a sort of proximate theory, which is probably nonsense. But to me, the rise of... Uh, that's a terrible way to put it. The, the rise of the drop in testosterone, I think it makes sense, right? The rise of the um, early the, the, the fall off in testosterone has also, I mean, probably maybe not causally, but certainly coincidentally, rise of single motherhood, rise of female authority figures for most boys' early childhoods, right? Daycare workers and, and primary school teachers are almost exclusively female, a lot of single moms around and so on. And I think a lack of proximity to, to other males may have some effect in the long run uh, on male testosterone. It would be interesting to me to see if there are any differences in different demographics uh, when it came to this testosterone. Uh, and because I know that male testosterone is very high when uh, you're a young man, and then it generally tends to decline when you get married, and then a little bit more when you have children, which makes perfect sense. You want a lot of aggression to go out and get the resources to attract a wonderful mate. And then when you get married and have kids, you want just a little less aggression because you want to be a good caregiver and, and a good father. But that, of course, given that uh, a lot of men are not becoming uh, fathers these days, partly because because they apparently have the uh, the sperm count of a late night subway ride. I mean, it's really terrible. It's because the effects are, are so multiplied throughout the entire male system. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right in pointing that I think it's about one in every five men right now have a uh, low sperm count and low and poor sperm count um, is one of the top reasons for for infertility. Utility. And so that might be another question about birth rates there as well, although I'm sure it's, again, only part of a larger picture. As far as um, single motherhood go, um, whew, that's a big topic. And, and I, oh, you but, see but, on the rise. But at least it's not controversial. At least we finally come across a topic that we're talking about that's not going to upset or offend anyone. Please go ahead, Faith. I, I, I insist. Um, look, very simply, if, if you can't raise a child or stay with the woman who you possibly might impregnate, 
don't pull it out of your pants. That, that's all I have to say. There's just and, and it goes both ways. Um, women, you know what I mean? Know what you're up to. And this is another video I have to make is, is, on, is on birth control because women are being sold <laughs> to lie right now about birth control and the fact that the pill is so good for you. I remember one time going for, um, it was like this thermography exam, whatever it was, and the doctor said, Faith, are you, are you on the birth control pill? And I said, no. And then he, like, he was like going to fill out his little form and he looks up. He goes, you're not on the birth control pill? I said, no. He walked up from his desk, came up and shook my hand. And I was like, what? what? He said, you're the only woman your age who I have ever had walk into this practice who has not been on the birth control pill. And I was like, what? And so this, of course, is because family history. I don't want to, you know, pump estrogen and all sorts of weird hormonal things into my body. But um, as a side note here, um, God actually built women with a natural family planning system system within us. Um, birth control was built into women. And this is something that they don't teach you in schools is the fact that, you know, they have apps for it now on how you can track your own body and you don't have to be pumping yourself full of hormones. And is it any wonder right now that women are frankly more unstable than ever, don't know what the hell, if they're coming or going, what they want. There's I, unprecedented amount of rage in women right now and all of that is coupled with you know these men who like are kind of girly men well maybe i can feel manly by getting my rocks off here and oh yeah by the way like sora nora so i don't know gender rules right now are so screwed up i i it, it it leaves me very very dismayed and without the fundamental building block of the family all of society will absolutely crumble so we got to start in our own houses I, I do have some sympathy for women these days when they look at, you know, listless man, boob, low sperm men. Uh, and it's like, hey, w- want to start a family? <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's uh, one, be- and, and I think that's sponsor. because throughout the West, the, the, the government has been in charge of gender relations for decades now. And yeah. gender relations is just another government program that has screwed up as much as every other conceivable government program has. I mean, everything from the welfare state to to affirmative action to equal pay for work of equal value to massive subsidies for female health care through the health care system as a whole, you name it, the, and, and family courts and divorce courts and all that kind of stuff uh, and, and tax codes. I mean, the government has been tinkering and manipulating and controlling gender relations uh, for decades. And Boy, you know, they're just way worse off than they've ever been, uh, I think. And um, at some point, you know, my big goal through through these conversations, through the work that I do, Faith, is people have got to stop looking to the government for the answers. Uh, mm-hmm. Not only is government not the answer, government is worse than an answer. It's the wrong answer. It's the answer that leads you in the opposite direction. You know, we, we care about each other as human beings. If there's no welfare state, people will be taken care of. Right now, they're not taken care of. Their votes are bought, they're sent anonymous checks, they're made dependent, they're made listless, they're made lazy, they're stuck in the Roach Motel of the welfare state. You can check in, you can't check out. One thing I loved about Christian charities in the 19th century, and I'm such a free market nerd, I've spent an inordinate amount of time looking at this kind of stuff, but I won't bore you with the details, But the charities really cared about Mm -hmm. whether people got better. How on earth does a government welfare bureaucrat benefit if you get off welfare? He doesn't, or she doesn't. In fact, uh, they have less justification for a budget next year. But charities used to visit people. They used to find out what their real problems were. They used to find out what was blocking them from a fulfilling life. And they used to work to remove those blocks, to be supportive, to be scolding, to do whatever it took to get people back into the productive areas of society to everyone's long-term happiness. When you used to have private charity, they were all competing for everyone's dollar and therefore they had to reduce the number of poor in their charge and that was beneficial to the poor. The moment you turn it all over to the state and I think the loss of Christian charity, the loss of, of free will, the loss, because now it's all this economic determinism. Well, you're, you're poor because you were born poor and it's Marxist determinism means you can't get anywhere. The, the loss of free will, which secularism has been unable to replace the loss of universal ethics with secularism has been unable to replace the loss of emphasis on family the loss of emphasis on voluntarism you know in christianity as you know if you're forced to do something it is no moral content there's no it it is no but now suddenly through the state the only way we can think of doing good is with the power of the state which is ultimately the power of coercion i just i miss the value and virtue of being able to choose, of being able to make the world better through my own will and choice rather than just assigning it to a bunch of bureaucrats who have the opposite intention of my preferences. Absolutely. And the government always fares poorer than the private sector does. Uh, Look no further than the fact that the the migrants that we're bringing in right now, 
are on the government purse. Um, virtually none of them have found work. Do you know who is finding work? The ones who have been privately sponsored. They're also learning English faster. But guess what Prime Minister Justin Trudeau did? He capped the amount of private sponsorships to 1,000. Well, we've got over 40,000 in public. What does that tell you? He wants the dependency. And look, the original social security system, uh, the original welfare system was the church and family. You know, um, you have an ill person, you take care of them. Of course, you bring them to the doctors, etc. But also, like, you're going to take time off work and, and, and tend to them. Them. And Christian charities will ensure to follow up that, you know, we don't have people who are slipping in between the cracks or doing nefarious things with, with the money that has been bestowed upon them, the gifts that have been bestowed upon them. Um, but all of that sort of um, uh, personal, moral exercising of, of really any sort of authority whatsoever has been removed from the, the equation. And so now we've got this automated system of just vouchers going every single way and no one is being held to account because, of course, you've got this like bureaucratic monolith of like, I don't know what, who, who answers to whom around here. And you've got thousands, hundreds of thousands, some cases, millions of people who are on the receiving end. And like, hell, I don't, I don't know what Ahmed or Mohammed's up to today, but like he got his food stamp. So like maybe he's OK. Uh, it's it's there's no accountability. And without the accountability, I can't expect um, a, a good return. Well, and of course, as we know, and just to end up, uh, we may deny accountability, but reality, math, uh, and basic physics will eventually bring accountability to us. It is just, of course, uh, my goal, and I dare to say yours too, Faith, that we have rational conversations in preparation for a society that is fundamentally unsustainable as it stands, but we hope we can turn it more towards freedom when it can no longer stand on its own two legs. So I really, really want to thank you. It was a great conversation. Uh, and, I have fun. And I, thank you, Stefan. This is great. And I really want to uh, recommend to people, you can get a very, very cheap monthly subscription. I think it's eight bucks or so, unless if you're a student, if I remember rightly, you can go to therebel.media forward slash Faith Goldie, twitter.com slash Faith Goldie and instagram.com slash Faith Goldie. The name of the show is On the Hunt with Faith Goldie. Thank you so much for your time today. God bless the